here. I'm watching the ushers. For those of you that are sitting in the back there, and those who are watching on the videos or whatever, there's a there's a minefield of wires down there. <laughs> I think it's bad. Oh. oh, please don't. But anyway, praise the Lord. Okay. Well, we'll go right into the, uh, talking about it. This is what we I've already given the outline in, in Sunday school, so we're gonna we're gonna press ahead. I, I, anybody see this? Discoveries. How many people saw that? Good for you. I, I just I just happened to see that. It's, you, know, you, know, you know what happens that says discovery? You know what happens is your brain. Have you ever looked at one of those things where it scrambles the letter yeah. and your brain can make it? That's the problem when you're doing slides or whatever. You you type it in and you see it and you read it, you proof it. Uh, like in the handouts, you're probably going to see a few typos in there. And uh, I did it when I, you know, you go, and you just don't. That's why you need a proofer. That's why you need other people to proof it, right? Okay. So. Uh, Brother Ed's got the sign back there. He says he wants me to advertise <laughs> BurningBrightMinistries.com. That's my website. Amen. And you go in there. There's a lot of other videos. There's the videos. Uh, in fact, the videos that we did here are on that website uh, that Ed did uh, on uh, uh, the King James Version Bible and Rightly Dividing. Uh, they're on there. And uh, some other videos that I've done. Guy Fawkes. And uh, Lord willing, this, these videos will eventually end up there as well. So this is a real blessing. Amen. Anything else I need to talk about? That? Couple <laughs> moment. Huh? I'll tell you later. Okay. All right. <laughs> you may proceed. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Ed's Amen. Yeah. Man, I appreciate it. Amen. So, uh, in fact, I've made I made comment uh, in my, on my website. If you go to my my page where it says more about us or whatever, uh, I mentioned that in there for many years. I was doing these scripture seminars for twenty years. And do you think in 20 years I'd be able to, with all the churches I've gone to, I would be able to get a good set of videos? No. No. Ed was the first one that really put some effort into it. And we actually got some good videos put on the web. And we get a lot of people from all over the world look at those. Right. Amen. Right. 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 So that's a, that's a real blessing. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to do an object lesson. I like to do these object lessons. So uh, can I have a volunteer? There, that young man there. Can he, do you want to come up and volunteer? No. How about his older brother? Come on up here. Come on up here. I need a, I need a volunteer. What's your name, young man? Maxwell. <laughs> Axel? Well, whatever. <laughs> hey, you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm Brother Deans. But anyway, I want you to look at these. Uh, this is, I want you to look at these ribbons there. Right? And examine them. They're just regular ribbons, right? What grade are you in? Seventh grade, so you're all knowing, all seeing. So it's going to be great. <laughs> now, see? <coughs> now, so they don't fall out. I better zip this up somehow. Okay. Zip it up. Now, what I'm illustrating here is giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm, I'm illustrating here, right? Uh, if you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and things in your life, He can put them all back together again and make them right. So, Amen. Uh, here. Why don't you give me one of those ribbons? I, I tell you what, I'm going to let you put them in so that people are doing some trick. Uh, let's say this is your uh, schoolwork. Let's say you're working hard, seventh grade, so go ahead and put that in there. You know? So that might be a mess, right? You're having trouble with calculus or something. You know? uh, this might be, let's say you play sports. And you have, you know, you play baseball and you haven't quite hit 1,000 yet. You know, you're probably in the 250s or something, so you've got to fix that. Not the Lord would give you a thousand, but I mean, you get the idea. You know? okay. Things are a mess. And let's say this is your love life here, right here. It's a <laughs> That's a mess, right? <laughs> so we don't we don't want that, all right? We don't want that. So what I'm going to do, the, the magic words. There's not magic words. We're not going to magic. This is object lesson words are please and thank you. So I want everybody to say please and thank you, please and thank you. Please please and thank you. All right. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ can put your life back together again. Go ahead and reach in, inside there. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that good? Amen. Thank you. Give him a hand. Amen. Hey. Uh, so, there. That's an object lesson. There. 
So I did one. And then there'll be more. I'll probably do one more tonight. We'll see. All right. The beginning of modern science. There was the Renaissance, the liberation of the individual, and the Reformation, the liberation of the believer. We talked about this last night. The Gutenberg Press. You had the Gutenberg Bible from the Gutenberg Press. You had the vernacular Bibles. And he had, within a generation, he had 40,000 works in circulation. It was the information age. 1456. But Vale Age Science was based on Aristotle and Tomley. Tomley was about, the, uh, about uh, if I get this right, about 100, 100 BC. Aristotle was about 300 BC. They didn't understand how blood flowed. They didn't understand why an arrow flies. And the astronomy based on Tomley was a, geo, a geocentric model with epicircles. What is that? I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you a video. But it basically, the Earth is the center, and everything orbits the Earth, including the Sun. Everything's stationary. And in fact, the universe orbits the Earth. Okay. That's what they believed right up until 1500 under Galileo, before Galileo. 1500, 1600. Right up. Got that? These two guys. That's what they believe. This guy, he, 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 he wrote the book on astronomy. Yeah, he wrote the book for 1,500 years. Was he right? <laughs> Absolutely wrong. But he gave it his best shot. You know. Let me show you what. Let me show you what epicircles look like. I don't think there's any sound with this, but it kind of gives you the solar system as he viewed it. An epicircle is these little circles here. So here's Terra. This is the Earth. Here's the moon going around. It's not spinning. But see Mercury? It's doing a circle. As it's going around the Earth, it's making a circle. Right. Venus is making a circle. That's what I mean by epicircle. Now, Copernicus, I think I said this last night, Copernicus looked at this and said, God wouldn't make it like this. He looked at this and said, there's got to be a better way. And he's the one that put forth, postulated the heliocentric. Uh, but here are these things. Are, here's the sun. The sun's not, the sun's way out here and moving, not in an epicircle. But the planets are circling. And the reason why they have to circle is because against a star field, the planets wander. I was trying to explain this just this, but... If you look out at the stars, mm -hmm. every night, they, in relation to each other, they stay the same as they're going through the atmosphere, going right. through, right? As you see them go up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. the, the planets don't do that, right? Sometimes you'll look at the moon and you'll see Venus. Yeah. Sometimes you'll look at the moon and you won't see Venus. They're wandering. That's, what, that's the word wandering. They're wandering. <clears throat> so how do you explain that? How do you do that? Well, he came up with this idea of an epicircle where they kind of move back and forth. As they're orbiting the Earth, they're spinning. It's very complex. But they had ephemeris. See, they could observe, they knew, they could tell when the stars were going to be at a certain place, and they could tell when the Earth, I mean, when the uh, moon and when the, the planets were going to be at a certain place. So how do you, how do you consider the ephemeris, the, the, the mathematical tables? Given those set of data, how do you explain what you're seeing? They never thought to think that the Earth would be orbiting the sun. Although some did. There were some people that Copernicus read about, but the, the science of the day for 1,500 years was the Earth's the center. All right, let's, so here's Copernicus. He lived from 1491 to 1506. 1492, what's important about 1492? <laughs> Absolutely right. Man, everybody must have passed the eighth grade. Whoa. Well, was another very important thing happened about that time was Martin Luther, the 95 Theses. So you see these contemporary things happening right at that time. Uh, he studied law, science, etc. He was kind of a Renaissance man. He had access to the world's largest libraries. He could travel everywhere, you know, and use the libraries. I think he was from Poland. And unworthy of a creator to need so many circles to move the sun and the planets, he devised a heliocentric model. He came across the works that postulated a solar system where the sun was the center. He came across some of those works. He wrote the revolutionary bus, and there's some other stuff, there's some other Latin stuff there. But anyway, he published shortly before his death. The reason why he did, why do you think he, wait, he waited to publish it just before his death? 
because of, it was not popular. You know, it's sort of like uh, e evolution is popular now, but not creation science. You lose your job if you believe in the creation story. You lose your job. Hey, you lose your job if you talk about heliocentricity. Not only that, you probably lose your head because the Roman Catholic Church didn't like it. Anyway, showing that the closer the planets were to the sun, the greater their orbital velocity. Now he, he had all the planets kind of in a circular motion around the sun, but he gave it a shot. He gave it a shot. It still didn't explain, but at least it gave at least it was closer to the, the real. Galileo, remember he had the telescope? He got in big trouble with the Roman Catholic Church because he received because of why? Because he saw a couple of things. Uh, the uh, moons orbiting Jup uh, Jupiter, and also he decided he was going to do his own scriptural Bible study. <laughs> he received a, board, a broad Renaissance education. Uh, I think I had the video last night, or you know, he studied science and physics and stuff. Very smart man. At the age of 46, 1610, he built his first telescope. What's important about 1610? We got our AB 1611 and 1611. Yep. So they were working on the Bible from 1604 to 1611. That's when all of a sudden, he gets this inspiration. Why don't I take this tele... All of a sudden, you know, quinky dinky. I'll get the inspiration. I'll take a telescope and look at the heavens. Right when they're putting your King James Bible together. Yeah. All right. He shook the foundations of the Aristotle and Cosmos and the Roman Catholic Church. He sure did. Uh, they still haven't forgiven him. Although that, that, the, the articles... The video we watched last night said the Roman Catholic Church under John Paul Pope the Third or something <laughs> forgave him or something like that, but uh, no, they never quite got over that. He saw mountains, valleys, and craters on the moon. Until then, the moon was thought to be smooth. He saw four moons of Jupiter orbiting Jupiter. He saw the face of Venus, which could only be explained if Venus orbited the Sun. Uh, you know, if the if the Venus orbited the Earth, I'm getting too much over it. The the Venus would stay the same size. Right, relative to us, if it was in a circular path around us. Well, he could look at Venus with a telescope, and Venus was getting bigger and smaller. Yeah. <laughs> Can't explain that right. unless it's orbiting the sun. Yep. So Venus was one aberration, and then the four moons orbiting Jupiter. The Roman Catholic Church had taught for 1,200 years that all everything orbits the Earth, and when. Galileo saw those four satellites orbiting Jupiter. The Roman Catholic Church says you are not, you don't see that. <laughs> Just like we're not supposed to see a creator in, in the yeah. what we see around us. Right. You don't see that. Right. He documented his, now this is where he got into trouble. He wrote a letter to the Grand Duchess of Tuscany and she ratted on him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she passed it over to the Pope. Look at this stuff. Resulted in his first trial and censor. In 1632, he published again. He was convicted. He went before the Inquisition, Galileo, over this stuff. Yeah. yeah. They did not take kindly to him, said uh, the earth orbited the sun. Mm -hmm. Published again, convicted on, on sus suspicion of heresy, and placed on a lifeline, lifetime house arrest. Now, let's talk about typology just for a second. Why would you want the sun, who would want the sun to orbit the earth? I'll answer it for you. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 4. For Colossians, I mean, 1 Corinthians 4, 4. Go to Corinthians 4, 4. Who would want the sun to orbit the earth? Isn't the sun, the sun, the type of Jesus Christ? All right, and earth is a type of what? World. Who would want the sun, Jesus Christ, to orbit the earth? I mean in typology. Who is, who is, somebody read me 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. I hope I got the right verse. Is that 1 Corinthians 4, 4? Yeah. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. I want, I gave you the wrong verse. Okay. Yes, read that. Read that loud, sister. Thank you. Uh, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Very good, sister. <laughs> you get that? Are we getting something interesting? So, who would want Jesus Christ to circle him? The God of this world. The 
the God of this world. See? Amen. Sure. Second Corinthians chapter four, four, verse four. In whom I'll just say because this is again on the video here. In whom, but that's that's good system. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of what Christ, who is the image, should shine unto them. It's just interesting. It says shine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like the sun. We get our light from who? Jesus Christ. Where's the moon get its sun? Light. And, and the moon's a type of the church. So anyway, just a little, little Bible, to finally get into the Bible. You know, it's, you can't teach science all the time. Amen. You know, watch out. You know, I'm dangerous. Okay. Uh, he published again. He's convicted a suspicion of heresy and placed on, on lifetime house arrest until he... Uh, uh, you know, until his death. Now, I took a, a thing out of there. I heard somewhere, and I, I think I saw it in a movie somewhere, where they made him recant. And the way they made him recant says, you either recant or we're going to put you on a rack. Now, I, don't, I can't find that recently, but I'll just throw that out there for you, you history buffs. You can look for it. Well, that's how much they loved Galileo. Why the response? The Roman Catholic Church did not take kindly Gala. He was a layman that dared to question the pronouncements and edicts of the church. He, he was attacking the science of Aristotle, which was, just so happened, the science of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. because if Aristotle was wrong, so was the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. and the Pope's infallible, right? Mm -hmm. huh. Here's what Dr. Thomas Sharp had to say. Dump, dumping Aristotle was key to the conflict. When you dump Aristotle and his dualism and his pantheism, all of a sudden you can, and his way of thinking, now you can do some amazing things. So all scientists making discoveries at the time, starting from Galileo on, were students of the Bible and Christian in their beliefs for the next 100, 100, 200 years. The Galileo incident was has been, um, the Galileo incident has been, in this it was Galileo who stood for the Bible not the Roman Catholic Church. Here's what Galileo said about the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures cannot err, and the decrees therein contained are absolutely true and inviolable. But its expounders and interpreters are liable to err in many ways, and one error in particular would be most grave and frequent if we always stop short at the literal significance of the words. Amen. You say, what are you talking about there, brother? Well, I'll show you. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 has to do with the Lord's Supper. Don't the Roman Catholic Church take the Lord's Supper literally? That they're actually changing the body, or taking the wine and the bread and making it the body and blood of Christ? They get this from John chapter 6. Probably from, you know, they all, they, if, if you want to have authority, it would be John 6. They, it doesn't matter if it's from the Bible or not. If the Pope says it is, it, 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 that's what it's supposed to be. But from the Bible, here's what they'll give you. Okay. Am I in the right place? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fifty-three. Right. John chapter six, pretty long chapter. After the page. Then, then Jesus uh, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. You take that literal. Do we take that literal? No. 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 We, know, we know that he's talking in, in allegory, in metaphor. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. You wonder why the Roman Catholics always eat the body and blood of Christ every, every Sunday? Because they're trying to have eternal life. You know, you, you would think, see, that's a picture of the Old Testament sacrifices. In the Old Testament sacrifices, they had day in and day out and day out, and then the blood of the, uh, the <coughs> day of atonement was done once a year. Right? Well, that should tell you that the blood of bulls and goats ain't good enough. It should show the Roman Catholic folks that when they're eating, eating the bread and the, and the, and the blood, and the body and blood of Christ on their Eucharist or whatever, it ain't good enough. Why? Because they have to come back the next week. It should tell them that. But the key to that verse is down here. Look at verse 63. All right, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that they speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. See, there's a case where the Bible translates itself 
And they say, well, should we right. take it literally or should we take it spiritually? We take it spiritually. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we take the Lord's Supper, we don't take grape juice and bread and turn it into wine. It's a picture. Bread turned into body of Christ is a picture. This is what I, I, I love to use this verse in, in, uh, in prisons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, again, talking about the Lord's Supper. This is Paul writing, okay? So he says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Uh, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Well, if we stop there at verse 16 and take it literally, it's we're actually drinking the body and blood of Christ, drinking the blood of Christ and eating the right. But now look at the verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. And I tell the guys in prison, I say, a loaf of bread? I'm saved. <laughs> you look like a loaf of bread? No, what is it? It's allegory, metaphor, it's picturing something. Amen. Yeah. I'm not the body of Christ is like it, it, Jesus Christ is likened to bread, right? I'm the, I'm the bread, you know, the manna come down from heaven. But it's not literal bread, it's spiritual. And uh, Galileo is just trying to say in certain scriptures that talk about that it seems that the earth is stationary, it's based on the reference of the observer. That's all he was saying. That's all he's trying to say. Look, I have just, all, just observed that there's moons orbiting Jupiter. You cannot deny that. So what are some of these verses that say the earth stands still? Well... Take them uh, as uh, uh, figures of speech. I'll give you some examples here. Guy argued that from Scripture that there was no contradictions in the Scriptures. He was a Bible believer. He was one of us. Amen. When it came to heliocentric model, he printed the Scriptures often noted for geocentricity, the earth is center, could be interpreted from the context of point of reference of the observer. Psalm 93, whatever. These verses will used a lot. I think there's a place in the Habakkuk. <coughs> Anybody see this book? Anybody see this picture? It's called Earth Rise. Now the guy that wrote that book lives, is a contemporary of us. When the Apollo astronauts went around the moon, yep. they watched the Earth rise as it came over the horizon as they were orbiting the moon. Mm -hmm. It's a famous video. It's the first time we ever saw the moon, the, the sun rising past the moon. These guys, these astronauts took a picture of it. Notice what they call it, Earth rise. Why did, it, why, did, why did the astronauts call it Earth rise? Because from their perspective, what was happening? The Earth was rising. Amen. They don't believe the Earth is rising. These people don't believe the Earth is rising. Your weatherman, when he says the sunrise is such and such a time, and the sun sets at such and such, he's not saying literally that it's you know, the sun is rising literally. It's from our perspective. If I was on Mars, I could sit, stand on Mars, and I would watch the Earth orbit Mars. Mm -hmm. or, or orbit Mars. I would watch the whole every every day because Mars is on spins on its axis. I would watch the universe spin around Mars 24. Well, I think it's a little bit longer, 24 hours and 30 minutes. And I would see the Earth orbiting Mars. Does the Earth mar orbit Mars? Mm -hmm. No. But from from a perspective, I think it is. Does the sun rise on Mars? Sure. Yes, if I'm standing on Mars, the sun rises and sets on Mars. It sure does. And that's all. That's all Galilee was saying. Don't make the scriptures. Don't make force the scriptures say something that they don't. You know, there's all kinds of figures of speech in the, in the Bible. So don't make it say something that it doesn't. But there's a, there's a classic example. How man first saw the earth. Earth rise. No problem. So that became a new English word. Earth rise. There it is. He wasn't trying to prove the scriptures wrong. In his view, the scriptures depended on the observer's point of view. It was too much math for the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Pope Urban, you got to give him a break, man. It, there were people trying to kill him. Yeah. So Galileo was just, uh, and he didn't need the Galileo to do this to him. <laughs> it's too much trouble. So Pope, poor Pope Urban, you know, they, they were trying to kill him. There's all kind of intrigue and everything, and then Galileo pops up in the Inquisition. He didn't need that any more on his plate. Okay. Uh, you know. So what is the context? That's the thing. You know. 
if the Earth, and I, I just explained this, but if the Earth were orbiting the Sun, velocity, this is Galilee, he says, the only velocity relative to itself would be zero. A person seated is not going anywhere. You are not going anywhere, are you? But in fact, you are going somewhere. The Earth is orbiting, right? The uh, Earth is orbiting the Sun, and you know what? The Sun is orbiting the center of the galaxy. The Sun is actually, I'll start, I'll start over on this side. The Sun is here, right? And the planet's orbiting. But the Sun is orbiting the orbiting the uh, center of the galaxy. So you know what's happening? We're actually going in a corkscrew. Mm -hmm. It's a slow corkscrew. We're actually doing a corkscrew. It's like a vortex. <laughs> Where's Dave? Hey, vortex, buddy. <laughs> there you go. That's what we're doing. Man. And that the whole galaxy is, is going somewhere. From our observation, everything's moving away from us. Oh, unbelievable stuff. A planetarium is built on this principle. I'm, get, I'm back in Galileo up here. I'm, I'm telling you, this guy, really, I mean, they were going to put this guy in Iraq for believing what we all believe, you know? Right. Yeah. You know, that's why global positioning systems work. That's why we can fly uh, satellites to Mars. And uh, we just had Voyager go outside the heliosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, but if you're seeing, you're not going anywhere. If you're sitting here, you're not going anywhere. But if you're in an airplane like I was just in, I'm traveling at uh, 350 miles an hour. But as, if I had the window shut, I don't, I don't think I'm moving. Because it's all relative to the observer, OK? In it's fine in Newtonian uh, back, you know, space. Life is good. You know, it's all based on a, if you're, when we were in F4, we used to fly formation. And relative to that F4, I'm flying, I'm flying formation, we're at uh, 420 knots, and we're flying, let's say, I would, be, I would fly route, what they call route, like a loose route on that. You've seen the Blue Angels do that, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they fly fingertip, all right? I'm flying at 420 miles an hour. I keep the, what they call the star on the light, the star in the back of the airplane and the light. I keep that fixed like that, and the pilot is flying. I'm just following him. But relative to him, I'm not moving. But I'm going 420 miles an hour. He's taking me somewhere, but I don't dare look where he's taking me. I better watch. I always look. I'll just tell one quick fighter story. But uh, one time we were coming back from Grafenbeer. There was four, four of us, four, a four ship. We flew all the way to Grafenbeer. Of course, that four has got two seats, the pilot in the front and the back. And I was the whistle in the back. So we start flying along. And my pilot says, hey, how, you want to fly? I said, sure. So I start, I start flying. So I'm I'm doing a you know flight on the star or whatever and I'm flying and then and my pilot he puts his hands up on the on the you know so he, the the other pilots can see him you know that I'm flying the airplane and he's just kind of relaxing you know well next thing you know you see the the lead pilot put his hands up there and so the wizzo I'm flying with the wizzo next thing all four of us all four wizzos we were flying the airplanes all the way back to uh, Hunt Air Base and man we thought we were something. <laughs> and, and, and four ship of whizzos, you know, wannabe pilots, you know, we were all flying. But that was, that was nice of the guys to let us uh, get a little stick time. So anyway, a person on Mars would see the Earth go around Mars once a Mars day. Does the Earth, does the Earth go to Mars? No. Galileo's, Galileo's persecution by the Roman Catholic Church is one of the watershed events between science and religion. It's always, it's put in textbooks. Ultimately, the persecution of Galilee via the Roman Catholic Church, and by default, the Bible and Christianity a black eye. Hey, the church that they call they call the church is not my church. No, sir. I'm not part of that Roman Catholic Church. No, sir. Okay. I am a Bible-believing Christian. Amen. Baptist. Amen. Amen. That's who I am. Okay. And I happen to like science too. Amen. By the way, Amen. very much. And like I said, I like science as long as they don't make stuff up. And they start making stuff up, I'm not very interested. See, what, what I'm doing here, what I'm doing here with this <coughs> seminar, this uh, conference for you, is what happened to me when I did my Greek critique in, uh, in Bible college. When I did my Greek critique and I saw that these guys, uh, first of all, were always using the wrong manuscripts to correct the King James Version, <coughs> Aleph and B, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. 
And sometimes they even didn't know uh, freshman Greek. No longer did I bow the knee to Greek scholarship. Right? Yeah. I realized that I could take a Greek, Nestle's Greek New Testament, and all I needed was an NIV, a New World Translation, and a King James Version Bible. I never had to, I didn't even need Greek. And I could determine what was right and what was wrong. What Greek, what, what Greek, uh, man, what Greek, uh, verse, or what I'm trying to say, uh, what was right in the Greek and what was wrong in the Greek. You know what? I know what was right in the Greek. If it, was, if it matched this King James Version Bible, I knew it was right. Yep. If it didn't, or they, you know, they usually take verses out. If they took the verse out, I knew it was wrong. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I, and you don't, I, I never have to bend the knee to Greek scholarship anymore. You don't have to bend the knee to science anymore. I've already given you a couple examples rocket scientists. Have you ever heard the expression, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, blah, yep. blah, blah. Well, you saw some scientists that weren't very <coughs> sharp. And they used math to prove themselves wrong. Now let's talk about Jupiter. This is something God created. And if I can get it, okay. So maybe one of the lights down, brother Ed. We'll do a little video on Jupiter here. Subject, this, this might be off a Discovery Channel or something. Uh, I got it off of YouTube, so non-attribution. I don't know. It's a very good video, though. Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system. So let's get this question out of the way. How big is it? Analyze it. This is Earth. This is Earth compared to Jupiter. It would take more than a thousand months to fill the fifth planet. But our journey today fixes a bullseye on Jupiter. Referencing data index, telemetry archive online. Most of the images you'll see come from various spacecraft that made the trip. Data now available. For example, Voyager 2 collected this remarkable sequence in 1979. Movies of Jupiter are exceedingly rare. Approaching periapsis. Most visiting spacecraft simply use Jupiter's immense gravity as a slingshot for journeys elsewhere. Low gain antenna online. Spectral and elite. Churning skies of roiling clouds compel the attention of even casual visitors. Jupiter's face is an opaque, seething mask, ever changing, revealing nothing but the small, dense core tens of thousands of miles. Hydrogen helium atmosphere. The planet's extraordinary rotation speed keeps the grinding sky in constant motion. The huge planet makes a complete revolution in just 10 hours. Enhancing image. Compared to 24 on our little Earth. Winds howl constantly at almost 300 miles per hour. Vector analysis. Without much wind, strange things are happening. Atmospheric anomaly detected. Like this, the famous red spot. The red spot is a rotating high pressure system, weather in other words, and it's a storm that's been churning for well over years, likely observed in even the earliest telescopic <coughs> observations of the planet. Just like our own planet, Jupiter changes every day. Deep space object detected on convergent vector. In July 1994, the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 fell into Jupiter's gravitational flow. Tracking 21 fragments. The planet's gravity ripped the wayward space travel into roughly 21 pieces prior to impact. impact. Shoemaker-Levy 9 delivered a rain of chaos onto the cloud tops of Jupiter's southern atmosphere. Simulation. The blast zone plume smeared across the planet's face like campfire smoke caught in thunderstorm winds. It was months following the impacts until most of the debris cleared from cloud tops, washed over by the gas giant's released atmosphere. Simulation, Earth encounter. Had these celestial bombs fallen to Earth, they would have decimated the planet. But Shoemaker Levy 9 may be one of the best demonstrations of Jupiter's great contribution to life on Earth. 
Jupiter's massive gravity field may be the solar system's vacuum cleaner that kept our own planet relatively weather free and allowed life to evolve. <laughs> Jupiter's massive gravity well holds more than 63 moons in orbit. It's a symphony conductor, commanding delicate, temperamental strings in the front and more sedate, tractable servants in the back. Analysis complete. Many of these worlds themselves are realms of mystery. Moons move at tremendous velocity, some zipping around the planet several times in a single Earth day. Further out, the crowd thickens. Moons occupy orbital tracks approximately 20 million miles above the planet. The farthest ones may take more than two Earth years to make the elliptical trip. Referencing subcategory. But the big, famous ones travel in close. Here's Io. Jupiter's violent gravitational tides push and pull Io's fragile structure. In response, the moon blasts angry bursts of volcanic fire above its blasted face. The big moons are all different too. Siblings circling their parent. They seem to first character, from rocky surfaces to odd density. <coughs> to places beckoning explorers to pay a visit. Like this one, you wrote it. The stimulus Europa may hide oceans, tantalizing us with the potential for life. Lions on the surface are really cracks in thick ice, suggesting fluid seas hiding more than two miles below. Here's another, Ganymede, orbiting a little more than half a million miles from Jupiter. It's the largest moon in the solar system bigger than even the planet Mercury. In a similar orbit, we find a place of quiet beauty. Sleepy Callisto shows the weary signs of age-old creatures. It's an icy tree, a silent dolmen bathed in deflected German light. We can be standard references. Index complete. Jupiter, giant the solar system, capture of the imagination. Systems coming. It is the Kilimanjaro to the wide open spaces of our solar system, and it pulls our curiosity and attention like a beacon when we look out into the darkness of space. Jupiter, Kia. Standing by. Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is very interesting because in your Bible it shows up. Remember the image that fell down from Jupiter? That's Greek gods or Roman gods that they, they worship. Uh, now, that's, can we call that a giant planet? But remember, there's a billion stars in our galaxy and there's a billion galaxies out there that, you know, we, we estimate a billion galaxies. Do you see all those moons going around Jupiter? How many knew about those when you were going to high school? Did they say there was 39 moons orbiting? No. And uh, Dave, did you see V'ger on that? <laughs> Dave's a Star Trek buff, but uh, there was Voyager that went there. They used they used Jupiter a lot as a slingshot to get you get you different places in the out there. So anyway, I threw Dave a bone. There's V'ger out there. Okay, for the man in the street, the Galileo Fair was evidence that the free pursuit of truth became possible only after science was liberated from theological shackles gauges. See how they twist that? They twist it. It's 180 out what's true. Many people in science still have that opinion today. You've got to kick Bible and Bible out of the school. You've got to kick it out of science. Kick Christians out of the school. Kick them out of science because they're going to hamper true science, but that's not, that's not true. Uh, that says, I'm studying science in the Bible, Grandpa. Um, 
I'm going to go a little bit further. That was going to be a break. I'm going to go a little further. Okay. In time, new observations from other astronomers poured in, and the evidence grew supporting the heliocentric model, phases of Venus, for example. The Roman Catholic Church looked like a fool. He had Tycho Bray. He was from 16, or 1546 to 1601, and he kind of came up with a, a high of a heliocentric model and a geocentric model. What he had is he had the Earth stationary. He had the sun orbiting the Earth and the planets orbiting the sun. That's the, that's the Bray model. If you ever hear of the Tycho Bray model. Well, it was a way to keep him out of trouble with the Roman Catholic Church, I suppose. But uh, he made precise measurements of the position of planets, and that was very important. He was an astronomer, made very precise measurements. And again, you can, depending on your uh, position, the way you view things, your, your uh, relative whatever, you can, make, you can make that model work. You could say, okay, yeah, here's the Earth stationary, Here's the sun. It just depends on your point of view, what you want to make stationary. So uh, uh, that's the way planetariums work. This model had the planets orbiting the sun and the sun orbiting the earth. He challenged Kepler, who was a, a worker, a co-worker with him, a, an understudy, to solve the problems uh, still found between the data and the planetary motion. When Kepler uh, realized the Copernicus method works if you make uh, the orbits elliptical. And he, he, followed, and he, he solved those uh, equations. So here's Kepler, discovered the three laws of planetary motion, he enabled Newton to formulate the laws of motion and universal gravitation. So now things are starting to roll. He had um, I think Francis Bacon, I think that's his name, 1561 to 1626. He's called the father of the, of the modern, uh, that should be empirical method because of his belief in experimentation and induction from data. He strongly, that's how he's putting it mildly, opposed Aristotle's deductive methods. He was a strong Bible believer and a contemporary of King James. Amen. All right. So modern science takes off. In the early 1700s, you have Galileo, Kepler, Newton. You have Otto von Gruck with the air pump and vacuums. That was kind of an interesting thing because that went against Aristotle too. He took two metal spheres put them together and then he sucked the air out of them. And you could not, with horses, you couldn't get them apart. And that was, that was really wild. That was, that, was a, that was a big discovery. The idea that there was air pressure keeping that, those spheres together. Because if there's a vacuum inside, then the pressure is pushing them in. So you got Pascal, Pascal's principle. John and I were talking about all these things I studied in college and you know, you know, you could, uh, when you're talking about the thermodynamics and calculus, you have three years of calculus, and I think there's differential equations. I mean, it goes on and on. For, you know, we're not going to take all the time that you have to just trust me that these are amazing discoveries. We take them for granted. We walk, we drive a car, we fly in airplanes, we look at Jupiter. We, we, oh yeah, people go to Jupiter all the time. These guys that were starting out with nothing, but practically nothing, coming up with this Boyle's law, volume versus pressure. Hook formulate basic laws of elasticity. How a spring works. You know, you guys have shock absorbers and all. He figured out the basic laws. They were not in existence until he come up with them. Uh, Haley, you ever heard of Haley's comet? Mm -hmm. well, he's the one that. That's why they named it after him. Because he he found these things, these weird things that weren't planets and they weren't stars. They were something else. They were comets. Then you have Isaac Newton shows up. He explained the complex in terms of simple forces. And he was a very brilliant man. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, like a, he believed in God, but he didn't believe in a personal God. He was only, he was kind of on the, on the, almost like a pantheist, really. But he did believe in God, he, and he was, uh, got some theological training. Uh, but he, he never, he was not a Bible, he didn't believe in the Trinity. Kind of weird. He, because he's his own man, he thought these things, and he, he wasn't. But he was, he did believe in God, of course. He had tremendous confidence in the power of human reason. So he wasn't really a pantheist in that respect. He believed in God, but he didn't believe in the Trinity, etc. Kind of an interesting theology he had. He concentrated on developing explanations based on calculus 
and observation. He says, God created it. I described how it happens. But Newton is kind of going away. He's trying to look at only the physical aspect of how things are and not putting God into it. I did not make a hypothesis. I just thought after him. And a lot of times an, an atheist will use the word God and pantheist will use the word God in kind of a sarcastic way. I don't think that was that was that case here. You believe in God. I do not make hypothesis. I just think God's thoughts after him. He's trying to think, how did God put things thing together? God is a watchmaker, and he had the task of finding out how the watch ran. Not bad. It was quite a lot of good stuff. Okay. Now, this thing here says Reformation grows tired. Are you growing tired? Yeah. <laughs> you can stand up if you want. I'm just going to go a couple more, about five more minutes. We'll be done. True. Reformation grows tired. It's called the Age of Enlightenment. So now we're getting away from the Reformation and theology and people thinking about God, arguing about theological things, now we're going into human reasoning. Mm -hmm. Now we think, now we can think as free human beings. See what the Reformation did? It freed you to think as free human beings. Isn't that, you know, Israel would get right and then within a generation they're wrong, right? They'd get chastised and then they would get wrong. In the 18th century, uh, many, many ways it was a period of optimism. Why do you think it was optimism? <laughs> Why do you think it was, it was optimism? In Christianity in this time, they were thinking of all millennialism. They were thinking we were bringing in the kingdom. You know why? Did you hear the music that was playing as the, the satellites were going through? That's cla called classical music. The height of music happened right after the Reformation, of, after, the, after you had the, the, the Reformation and the Bibles. Outstanding science, you know, the pure sciences, outstanding things happening in medicine. The Brits were going all over the world and teaching the heathen. They were bringing civilization to the heathen, and in some cases, slavery to the heathen. But they're bringing civilization to the heathen, and the heathen were learning how to read. They were learning how to, you know, wear clothes. They were getting technology. They were bringing the kingdom to the whole world, and then we're going to, and then Jesus Christ comes show up. There was a lot of optimism. This man is a brave new world. All the darkness that had been in the dark ages for a thousand years, the shackles are coming off. But we started to get too high on our horses. Mm -hmm. and, and, in, and the age in which reason was enthroned as the ultimate. So we're gonna tonight we're gonna pick up on this. And we're gonna go through the rationalism mm -hmm. and uh, that type of thing. And then we're gonna talk about our attack. Us guys, yeah. like us, are going against them and saying, hey, first of all, this is the book you ought to be reading, and this is the one you ought to be believing. And then our science is better than your science. Na, 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 na. <laughs> That's what we're going to do tonight. And then I got a lot of more good videos. And uh, I told a pastor, pastor, if, if I run out of time, uh, we're not doing PowerPoint. I'm going to show you these videos. You've got to see these videos. And these men, the biologists, I mean, credentials, super credentials, talking about Darwinism. And uh, yeah, we're going to go, nah, 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 we're going to do this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, a it's, it's a blessing. All right. I want to do, uh, one thing I want to do, though, is before we quit here, you know, we're talking a lot about the Bible, we've talked a lot about science, and, but the, the main thing, really what's the most important thing is what? Where do you go when you die? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I mean, uh, we know, Regardless of what the world thinks, I mean, there was Christians living under atheistic Russia for uh, 50, 60 years or whatever. And they just, they had a strong faith and uh, they did the best they could with what they got. They were loyal citizens of the Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union persecuted them and stuff. And uh, we're going to be the same way. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be Baptists. We're going to be independent Baptists. We might get persecuted for whatever we believe. But, uh, you know, the one thing that we have going for us is we're going to heaven when we die. Amen. 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 And the reason why we know we're going to heaven and die is because of the one thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The Bible says, uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. There's only one thing in the universe that can blot out your sin, 
and that's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. He came 2,000 years ago. It's a fact, a historical fact. We have many witnesses. We have people wrote down their accounts. They actually saw him eyeball to eyeball before and after he rose from the dead. So we don't have any problem with that. And uh, as I said last night, uh, just because you don't see it doesn't mean we can't see it. Right. A blind man cannot tell a person that can see that they can't see. Uh, a colored a blind person can't tell a person that can see colors that they're not seeing colors. Yeah. And we, we see it. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, if you're here this morning and you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Turn to, Rome, uh, turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Who was the first hellfire and brimstone? Some of you folks probably know, brother. Pastor Struble has probably told you this. But Mark chapter 9, I'll tell you who was the first hellfire and preacher was. And it wasn't a Baptist. It was the creator of the universe. Who knew? Who knew? Mark chapter 9. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. We'll start at verse 40. Or verse 41. Uh, let's see. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell in the fire that never shall be quenched. Hell. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. That's red letters. That's Jesus Christ. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter in life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never quenched. There's number two. He says it twice. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. <clears throat> He's serious about this. None. This ain't no allegory. This is the real deal. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 20, 47. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two fires to be cast into hell fire. Hell fire. First hell fire and brimstone preacher was Jesus Christ. Yeah. Where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Jesus said, before going to the cross, he knew what his purpose was. He said in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth is not condemned. No. He that believeth, he that not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. That's right. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's the red letters. That's Jesus Christ. So if you not receive the Lord Jesus Christ today, I... I encourage you, whether you're watching on the video, whether you're watching live, or if you're here in this auditorium, uh, when we have an invitation, if you want to have an invitation, uh, pray that uh, that you that you uh, receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, "For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." I tell guys in prison, you know, there's no model prayer on how to get saved. <clears throat> Just get the blood on you. Amen. Yeah. Say, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Be merciful me, a sinner. Take me to heaven when I die. Amen. I don't want to go to hell. Take me to heaven when I die. And he'll do it. The Bible says that uh, you must be born again. He'll, it's like that. Salvation is not a process. Birth. Amen. Amen. It's a conception. It's like that. It's like that. And you can, you can do it today. You can do it right now. Just like that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then you can get on the winning side, amen? Amen. 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 Right, so just here a second, but uh, remember, if you can't come back tonight, as, uh, as you can see from this morning, uh, that the world out there, education, science, whatever you want to call it, wants to tell us that you can't believe this and be a scientist. Uh, and the news, it all goes back to Galileo versus the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and the Roman Catholic Church, in a sense, put a black eye on everyone that wants to believe in this book. Because mm -hmm. what they said is that, hey, you know, the, the church tried to 
you know, keep Galileo and scientists down, when in fact Galileo was a Bible-believing man. Yeah. Uh, liars, folks. And the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of scientists, biologists, not even saved ones, that believe that there has to be a creator. Yeah. I mean, he's going to have a bunch of them tonight on the screen and showing you what they say. Again, these most of them aren't even saved people. I mean, but they're scientists that are honest enough to say, hey, this is evolution, didn't happen, you know, or the Bible's got the answers and, and all that sort of thing. So again, it'll be really good tonight. And man, if you can make it out, uh, to make it out for that. All right? Now let's have a word of prayer and we'll be this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank the Lord for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, again, we can have confidence this morning in what we believe. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, higher learning and criticism today, Lord, would, would have us as Bible believers, Lord, to hang our heads in shame, Lord, and uh, have us not confident in what we believe. Uh, Lord, uh, but uh, God, I just pray that we would be confident in what we believe, Lord. And I, understand. I pray that we'd be able to make it back, Lord, be further encouraged, Lord. Uh, in, in what uh, truth is, Lord, what true science is, Lord, and what true science has shown, Lord, when uh, comparing Darwinism, Lord, and these other Bible rejectors, Lord, uh, uh, as opposed to Bible believers, Lord, and I just pray you uh, be with us as we go, give us a good afternoon of rest, Lord, and relaxation, and Lord, will it bring us back here tonight, Lord, God, and I thank you and I praise you for Jesus, our Savior, in his name we pray, amen. 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 amen.